Next up, another lightning talk. Shaf has been working in the tech industry for over 15 years. He is the co-founder of the Riz Test and leads our Muslimic Makers Manchester chapter. His talk on Hollywood tech ethics and biased AI is a real treat. I've seen a longer version of it. You'll get a 10 minutes version of it, but I know it's going to be absolutely incredible. Over to you, Chef. Thank you. Asalaamu Alaikum, everyone. So, I'm going to start with a joke. Two Muslims walk into a bar. Right. <laughs> Who hears all the punchline? No? <laughs> right. Astaghfirullah. Well, I'll give you the punchline at the end of the talk. Between now and then, I'm going to talk about three things. The first thing is the risk test, why we founded it and why it's important. The second thing, I'm going to share with you some data and insights from the risk test. And finally, I want to talk to you why it's important in this day and age, in the age of AI and machine learning. Also, I'm going to speak really fast in my Mancunian accent. So hopefully you can pick up. And it's great to see so many Mancunians representing today. We always do, right? Woo! Yeah. <laughs> so first off, what is the risk test and why did we find, found it? So back in 2017, me and Dr. Sadi Habib in Manchester, we founded the risk test. We were having conversations about, well, how are Muslims represented in film and TV? So we launched a project, these five criteria. Now I'll let you read it yourself, but the criteria are centered around how Muslims are presented as terrorists, as angry, a threat to a Western way of life, misogynistic or oppressed. None of this is new to me, and it's not new to you either. Right? We, all, we all recognize these tropes that we've seen on film and TV. Now, um, now that you know what the risk test is, I'm going to do a worked example with everyone in the room, right? So move on to um, the um, Iron, Marvel's Iron Man, released in 2008. Now, who's seen Iron Man? Right? We've all seen it, we all thought it was great. And that's the beginning of the MCU, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Now, you know the risk test. Do you think it passes or fails the risk test? Yeah. Fails. Of course it fails the risk test, right? But why does it fail the risk test? I've summarised the movie in one paragraph. Tony Stark is held captive in an Afghan cave by the Muslim Raza and the Temrins group. He's helped by a scientist from Golmera, an Afghan scientist from Golmera called Yin Zen. Now, I'm in a room full of geeks, right? I'm in good company here. Now, who has read the graphic novel from 1968? Right, just me, it's okay, it's okay, <laughs> right? So what I did, being a geek, I compared the movie to the source text. And when I found that, when it looks a little bit like this, Tony Stark is held captive in a Vietnamese cave by Wong Chu, not Raza, by Wong Chu, and a generically oriental scientist from Golmera, which doesn't exist, called Ho Yin Zen. Not Yin Zen, Ho Yin Zen. It doesn't take a historian to realise in 1968, it was the height of the Vietnam War. And in 2008, it was the height of the war in terror. So in that time, the producers thought, well, who are the bad guys of today, right? They made that choice in the production room somewhere. So along that time, in that, in, that, in that 40 years, something happened in the production room somewhere, but I can't quite put my Muslim finger on it. So the Muslim tests have been covered in all around the world by a number of different publications, and, and we, we, we've, been, we've been cited in a number of different academic papers as well. Um, so I'll talk about, so that's the first part. The second part is the data from the risk test, right? Uh, we, we, the, 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 the project is a crowdsourced project, so we've had 1,500 movies reviewed, which span about 120 years. Now, I want to, I want to visually uh, represent that for everyone in the audience. That's 1,500 squares on the screen. I copy and paste each one of them, right? <laughs> so the first thing is, the first 10% of that data set we threw in the bin. It didn't qualify for the risk test. The next 5%, it didn't qualify for the risk test because the films were pre-Islam. Now, I'm talking about films like Antony and Cleopatra, Ben-Hur, it's pre-Islam, so it didn't qualify for the risk test as, as per our criteria. The next 5% didn't qualify for the risk test, but they had, didn't have Muslim characters in the movie, but they did have negative dialogue about Muslims and Islam. And that 10%, I call that VID, very important data. It didn't qualify for the risk test, but it's very important that we consider this later on. So the question is, the 80% that remain, how many pass and fail the risk test? Now, shockingly, maybe not, we found that 87% fail the risk test. So that's nine times out of 10 are Muslims on screen. They're presented as terrorists. 
as a threat to Western way of life, misogynistic or oppressed. Anyone shocked here? No, neither were we. And only 13% passed. Now, for the eagle-eyed amongst you, there's one movie in the corner that we've not accounted for. That's one movie that has, doesn't have a Muslim character in it, but it speaks of Muslims and Islam in a positive way. One movie. And that is 1999's um, at Raising Arizona, which is proof, further proof, that Nicolas Cage has done everything in his career. <laughs> so, um, we've got this huge data set but with this, with this huge data that we've got, right, we're a bunch of geeks, right? We want to interrogate the data. What we'll be able to do is ask questions of the data. And what we found is that Muslim men are presented as misogynistic and women are presented as oppressed across the last hundred years as a consistent theme. The next question, how are Muslims portrayed in sentiment analysis perspective? You can see up in the upper quartile, Muslims are always presented as superstitious and backwards and always are presented as angry. That angry Muslim meme, it's pervasive. It's all over Hollywood and Bollywood, Nordic cinema, all around the world. The last one, I had to double check the stats because I was a little bit shocked by it. The last one, how are Muslims authorised in film and TV? Over the last hundred years, there's been an exponential increase of how Muslims are presented as a, West, or as a Western threat and as terrorists. And again, it doesn't take a historian to plot geopolitical events across that timeline. So the question is, that's all very, very interesting, Shaf, but why is it insignificant? Does anyone recognise that character? Great, 10 points. So, um, so it's Miss Marvel, of course it is, right? But why is it in in insignificant? Which brings me to the third part of this presentation. Now, the three big players in the AI Text, uh, t, uh, large language models uh, space are Google, OpenAI, ChatGPT, and Meta. Now, to understand these, you really have to understand the data that is trained upon. Broadly speaking, it's three broad data sets. The Google C4 data set, that's 15 million web pages. The Common Crawl data set, that's 1.82 billion web pages. And terabytes of undisclosed data, that's that OpenAI don't actually release what data it's trained upon. Now, let's do a deep dive in one of them, that's the Google C4. The Washington Post did a really great deep dive analysis of the web pages that, it's involved, that, that, that it scrapes. It looks like this. This is the broad categorization. Now, again, you can read that yourself, but the two that I'm most interested in are these two, news and media and arts and entertainment. And what you can see in news and media, the sites that are scraped are reputable sources, right? There's New York Times, LA Times, The Guardian, but also Breitbart, The Daily Mail and The Sun not exactly known for their sympathetic portrayals of Muslims, right? And second of all, the sources in the arts and entertainment, which are more important to me, in that you've got movie and TV subtitles and scripts, user-generated reviews. Now think about that supply chain of data. We talked about the risk test, Iron Man, and all those movies, 1,500 movies, nine times out of 10 Muslims are presented as terrorists and Western way, a threat to a Western way of life. And that's all being fed into these, these, these data models. Now, personally, I think that's shocking, right? I, and, and, I, and I think that's, that's BS, to be quite honest. And when I say BS, I call that bigotry as a service. And, on, and, and, and again, you might think, that's shaft, that's very, very harsh for you to say. Don't take my word for it. This is on the DALI documentation, on their GitHub page. This is live right now. The use of DALI has the potential to harm individuals angered by reinforcing stereotypes or subjecting them to indignity. This is on their GitHub, GitHub page. Since when was bigotry a feature and not a show-stopping bug? Who in this room would release a product with a bigotry disclaimer on it? So why do we accept it from the big four? It's not just Dali. It goes to Google as well. Google, on the Imagine, um, the, the, the research page, they actually say the preliminary assessment suggests that Imagine caused several social biases and stereotypes. This is on their homepage. The, the funniest thing in all of this is that, is that disclaimer at the end, we hope to make progress in several of these open challenges in future work. We all know what that is, right? We all recognise that. That's the mum, inshallah, right? That means it's never going to happen. So that brings us back to the beginning of the talk. Two Muslims walk into a... According to ChatGPT, the thing that we're all posting on LinkedIn about, we're all, we're all excited about ChatGPT. According to ChatGPT, two Muslims walk into a... Synagogue with axes and a bomb. Another one. Two Muslims walked into a Texas cartoon contest and opened fire. Now, this is research by, done by a few, uh, few uh, academics. 
Now, it's not just that. When you put that into ChatGPT, 66% of the time, it comes back with violent actions. Shocking? Surprised? Now that we know that the supply chain of data that goes into these things, we have to engage critically with the data, or the, the, the tool that we have, the AI that we have. My one, my one takeaway for you this today, the one call to action for everyone in this room, I want to walk away with new, uh, with new vocabulary, and that for me is fast AI. Now we think of fast fashion as something negative with unethical supply chains, it's, it's, it's unsustainable, it, it impacts minorities. Now I want you to think about AI the same way, I want you to start using the term fast AI. We need to, we need to engage critically with these, these products and services. And when, this is a room full of technologists, game changers, change makers, developers, designers. In your workplaces, have these tough conversations because our humanity, our dignity is worth more than that. Thank you so much. Amazing. Um, I told you guys this talk was going to be a real treat and it really is. Mm -hmm.